Can you hear me? Hello. 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 All right. Let's get this started. So, hello everyone. My mom can see and hear us. That's a good sign. <laughs> uh, Hello, I'm Malachi Ray Rempen. And I'm Eric Rempen. It's my brother Eric, right here. <laughs> wow, you look super potato quality. Why is that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, thanks for joining our stream. This is partly a stream. Well, the reason I'm doing this is it's a design diary in video form because I wanted to kind of go through uh, Roll Camera's history um, in terms of how it started and through some of the decisions that were made and show you kind of some of the prototypes and what those looked like um, and then until we ended up with the final version and I thought well I could write a physical diary or I could join you here in person and you can ask me questions if you like and if not the video will go up on YouTube at some point and that'll be the one for history uh, otherwise you can feel free to interrupt me at any time um, and ask questions. Uh, my brother Eric was there since the beginning, really. That's right. Um, was there since when I first came up with the idea all the way through most of the iterations of the, um, and some hilarious commentary. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, and my cat's here as well. Yes, yeah. so we got everyone. I got here my big box of old roll camera <laughs> prototypes. I'll get that to that in a second. But Roll Camera started as a, um, on a tabletop simulator. It was the digital version as, as when it began. I mean, I like to do most of my designs, I've noticed recently anyway, in tabletop simulator at first because it's, it's the, where I can iterate the fastest and get the most. Uh, I don't have to spend too much time cutting out cards and, and printing stuff out. I can just like quickly upload things to tabletop simulator and, and get that design running up and running as fast as possible. Do, do, you, do you remember how long it took to go from the very beginning to the finished product? Uh, so it was probably about two years. Um, I initially first came up with the idea in 2018. So I was, I just finished itchy feet in 2017. I did the itchy feet card game launch and that was the only board game, I had planned to make, but it was such a big success that I thought like, well, I better uh, at least try another game. Um, and so I had the idea to um, do a filmmaking game because my background is as a filmmaker and I had not seen another board game that captured what it was like to make a film. So I spent a lot of my youth and uh, up until very recently, um, as a filmmaker, making lots of films, teaching people how to make films, working in the film industry, spent a lot of time on sets, and I a lot of the filmmaking games that existed were really from this like top-down studio management perspective, or were competitive, like your competitive studio executives making films, and that's not really what I wanted to capture. I wanted to capture what it's like to be on set, to set up the camera, and challenges and creative solutions you have to come up with to actually shoot a film, boots on the ground, day to day. Um, getting it in the can, so to speak. So um, that's what I sought to capture with Roll Camera. And um, yeah, that was the initial. And so, so then and it finished, the, the campaign launched in 2020. It was height of the pandemic. Uh, it was summer 2020. So that would have been, yeah, about yeah, two years, more or less, I figure, from initial uh, ideation to final launch. Most of that I guess would have been in, I guess a year and a half. So yeah, most of that would have been in 2019. So most of this journey that we're going on in, through the history was in, was through the 2019. So that's where the idea came from. And that was December, I was on my, I remember when I got the idea, I was on my way to a Christmas party, uh, a work Christmas party. And it kind of struck me like, ah, board game about filmmaking. Surely it's, it's been done before, it was too obvious. Um, because, you know, actually filmmaking and board games, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, you work in a, a specific defined space. Uh, you have like pieces that you're moving around in this space in particular setups. You have people who have specific roles that they're taking on with special abilities and superpowers. And um, you are working under limitations of uh, resources, you know, specifically time and money. 
and I wanted, so I felt like it would, it was kind of obvious, like it should have, should certainly had been done before, but I guess nobody met, met that Venn diagram of like filmmaker and board game designer. So I thought, wow, I'll take my crack at it. And um, I came up with the first design, which uh, looked like this. Let's see. Wow. <laughs> Spent a lot of time setting up that transition. <laughs> Um, so this, this was before I even had the name roll camera. This was just when I thought, okay, I got to capture filmmaking. So I just did that in the most literal way I could think of. So literally, I mean, actually the, the thing that does is there from this version, from this very, very first like iteration I put together are, uh, cards as shots or shots as cards rather, because it kind of occurred to me, like it struck me as part of that initial inspiration, like, oh, you could have shot scenes, like storyboard scenes are already kind of card shaped. So why not have that be where the card is, or like where the shot is, the, the shot you have to get. And the, um, it'll tell you on each scene, like what you need to, um, to have to, um, to make it. So that was the idea, and there was going to be like, okay, this is the type of shot, and it needs this many lights and this many actors. Um, I also knew at this time I wanted to have this like cartoony look that's very similar to my Itchy Feet card game. It's not the way the art I want to have for every game I make, but I wanted this one to kind of build on that. Ordering a stiff drink. <laughs> <laughs> location pub. I remember the locations. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, there's a bunch of locations. So the this was the way that it worked was they had these giant location tiles, interior house, exterior field, cave, street, cemetery, beach, pub. Here's the pub. So we know, okay, we gotta shoot in this pub. It has to be in that location, which already is quite restrictive. And then we've got these little hex grids and you have to like put the lights out. Okay, we got this, shoot this scene here. We had to put these lights out on these on this hex grid. And it just said they needed two lights. It doesn't say it needs to be anywhere in particular. So that, oh yeah, we have a little dolly track. There's a camera you could put on the dolly track or like have the car drive straight into the pub. This car is pretty cool. I don't, I don't remember the car actually being a, a set item. Yeah, I think the idea was it could be like a prop. You could like put the camera on the car because they have those like cam mount car mount cameras. Um, and then there was like extras and these were like your crew. It was just, it was, I, I'll, I'll never forget. I sat down to play this with you. Oh, here's genres. Ooh, action. Ooh, Western. Oh, so the genre thing was there at the beginning. That's funny. I didn't even remember that. <laughs> the problem was, so the, the whole game idea was that you had these different roles and, uh, the, the roles would have these responsibilities. It was co-op. I knew I wanted that. They can move the director token around the set. They can call action and cut and set the shot timer. They can hire extras. Mm -hmm. They can assemble the shots in the finished film. And they can veto things, like they could veto locations, costumes. Here, the mm -hmm. producer can veto shot choices, spending. It was literally like, oh, you take this role, and then you make a film, and then you can like choose, you can like, in, in the way that the set hierarchy is built, like your role has powers over the entire game's mechanics. The cinematographer can only veto, but they can like rent equipment, they can move gear between locations, all this stuff. Right. And it was just, I'll never forget, I played it with you. We brought, we brought up this, I, I set up this tabletop simulator, it was in my in-law's kitchen. Mm -hmm. We played one round of it, and you were like, well, it's not very fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I realized, yeah, it's not, it's a bit of a mess. It's too much work. <laughs> it's too much work. And so I went to a friend of mine. I, I, so I went back to the drawing board, basically, and I was mulling around a bit. And I, um, I asked, if, at the time, I hadn't really played many board games. And so I thought, like, I need another, I need a point of inspiration. I need a place where I can enter into the design and, um, uh, and kind of approach filmmaking from, I need a point of abstraction. So I was like, I need another game to take inspiration from. And I wondered if there was another game out there that had a crew mechanic where you'd like dealing with a crew, because I wanted that to be the big core of it. That like everyone's got these roles and, they, and everyone's like working on this crew. And um, 
I went to this friend of mine because I hadn't played that many board games and I had a friend of mine who got me into board games and was I asked him, like, is there a game like that? And he's like, well, you should borrow my copy of Deep Space D6. I think that was really interesting that you kind of started this adventure from nothing, from the beginning, not having any knowledge of, of how uh, board games normally function. Yeah, well, that's why I kind of wanted another game to work from. Uh, to be inspired by uh, something I could um, I mean <laughs> it's gonna sound what it sounds like is that I'm saying uh, that I'm stealing it which I guess is not untrue in a way like especially at the beginning what I took from deep space was uh, very similar like initially quite similar but then when I realized I was going to end up using uh, this guy's, you know, the, the game mechanics. I actually reached out to Tony Co and I asked him, "Hey, is it okay with you if I borrow this because it's perfect for my game?" And he was like, "Oh yeah, sure. He's super, he's super sweet guy." Huh. Um, he said there were other people who had borrowed similar mechanics but had not asked permission, and that really bothered him. Um, I mean, you can't actually copyright game mechanics, right? So I didn't actually need to ask his permission, but I didn't feel right borrowing so heavily from his core mechanic uh, uh -huh. of this game and not, you know, attributing it right. from film. Give credit where credit is due, as they say. Uh, all right, let's see. Yeah, Movie Demand says, most things are a remix, but still your idea. Yeah, it's like a adapting from, from different sources um, and taking them and kind of putting them into the game. As it needs to be. I never played the, the ship management game, but uh, I guess when we take a look, we'll see how similar it is. Uh, so this, if you haven't played Deep Space D6, this is a solo game. Um, Tony did make a multiplayer version of it, um, but yeah, I wanted to. I wanted to, so I borrowed this copy of it by a friend of mine, not this TTS version, but like the physical version. I all highly recommend if you're into like space games, solo games, uh, to get this one if you can get your hands on it because it's super, super cool. So basically the way it works is you have your, um, you have your ship here with these different uh, rooms in it. And then you have your crew dice. Looks familiar, right? And each of the crew dice has these different uh, like roles. So there's the captain, um, there's engineering, there's weapons, or that's engineering, and this is uh, infirmary, I think medic. And then there's also this like alert face, which when you roll that, you have to slot it up here. And when you roll three of those, you uh, have to bring up a bad thing. So like there's a pandemic on the crew and you have to send the crew to the infirmary. And so down here, the um, the, the sort of the bad things, uh, like the problems, I guess, or it can be problems, they can be enemies, they can be different challenges that come up out of this deck here. And they come down here and you can resolve them by using these dice faces that are, that are listed here. Um, so here you have to send a, a unit to the infirmary. So what you do is you like roll your dice and then you can assign to these different parts of the ship to do these different actions. So the captain can change other dice or re-roll them, the, you know, reassigning people um, the, the engineer can repair the hull because here you have like damage that goes, you got shields. So it's like these, um, uh, these go down the, sh you know, the, 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 um, oh, I guess this is engineer. Anyway, it doesn't matter. The green face can, uh, can fix the, can fix the shields. Um, the medic can, can heal people or bring them back from the infirmary. So anyway, I took this and I, I was like, oh, this is great. I'll try this out and see if this works. And so I pulled up the second draft of Roll Camera, which looked like this. I mean, there's a lot of similarities here with the problem tracker, the moving the problems along, and the, the actual placement of the crew. Yeah, you'll notice a lot of similarities already from how Roll Camera was um, at the beginning. Um, and this. And that's because that basic mechanic, that like core game loop of like roll the dice and see what you get and see what you where you can assign them, uh, is just fun. It's just fun to see like what are you gonna there's tension like what are you gonna get, and where are you what are you gonna do with the resources you've been given, and this is why I think people say uh, part of the reason I think roll camera is considered 
a thematic game, even though that particular mechanic of like rolling your crew dice, seeing what you get, like that doesn't happen on a movie set. You don't ra get a random assortment of people and right. jobs like when you're on set. However, the feeling of like, we don't know what the next day is gonna bring, or we don't know what resources we're gonna have and like what, how we're gonna be able to work with what we, what we have to do is exactly like filmmaking. That feeling is, is like dead on for what it's like to like get up every morning before a day of set go to set and say like okay well i wonder like here's the job we have to do but like can we actually do it every single day which can get um you know can get quite stressful so that i think was really captured really well by these dice so then this early early version i had um i had crew dice here you can see um and i had equipment dice so there were two ty types of dice so the equipment dice had like the, the slate and the lights and mic there's a blank one um there was the wild or maybe no that wasn't even wild yet that was just visual effects <laughs> it was that's all it was um and then the crew had the different main uh roles that you would see on a film set so you know um you had the director you had actors or that was the director i guess this was the cinematographer actors director producer production designer and uh, then there was the problem and exactly like in d6 if you rolled these you had to slot these here and then if you got to you had to draw one of these problem cards and these problem cards would be you know like like they are now uh, they would be different things you had to had to do but these in order to resolve them you needed to use specific dice um, yeah and then there were trackers I mean this even looks like the deep space you know there's like budget and schedule but it's these trackers that go down um, and then I had this thing, if you remember, where like if you got down to a certain point, you would get an additional penalty. And I remember you were the right. one that said that was too. This was in the design for a long time. Yeah. Until it was just like, well, you're just getting punished for losing. <laughs> it's no yeah. good. The problem was that you, it would be harder to win at that point. Right. Which just basically meant you lost when you got there instead of losing when you get to the very end. Yeah. Yeah, and this would give you minus one crew die, which was incredibly punishing. I mean, the idea was thematic, but like you don't have enough money to pay your crew they're not going to stick around but i can see why it didn't really work um then you, you're the dice could you know the producer could go here um and i did have this quality track or at least a form of it so there were no idea cards yet but there was this idea of already from from this point of like you can go um basically towards mainstream and then you win awards but if you get too, if you go too far, then you can lo you lose all your awards, or you go bad in quality until it's uh, a cult classic. And then these awards were like what the ideas were. So the awards were here: least boring monologue, any shot with only one actor uh, can gain an extra quality, best communication. Um, as an action, you can remove one of the problems from the office. Uh, this is an extra thing you could like, you know, place a, an actor here. Best paperwork. I mean, these are funny. I like these. <laughs> Roll three in a row, and you can remove one problem and reshuffle it in the problem deck. So it gave these things. It doesn't really make sense to have the awards. Um, that you win the awards during the shooting. Yeah, you win awards during shooting. It really makes sense. But I mean, the problem is there's a there's a lot going on here. So there's like two sets of dice, mm -hmm. and when you roll the equipment, they have to go. They have to slot them into the gear truck first. Right. And then you can assign the ca the camera person here to then choose equipment to go out on set and like in order to shoot you need to have the slate here and then you have to have the director and the camera cinematographer just a lot of steps to get to the there's like the backdrop here and they get different quality amounts of the backdrop again it's like right on this set thing here but you know the editing room was here as it as it ended up being where the shots, uh, you know, once you had shot these shots that came down here very much like Deep Space D6 with the down the side, you would like move them over here. This one would lose you a quality, but cost two, cost one. This is the setup. So again, this this actually looks quite similar to how the shot cards ended up, the scene cards. Right. There's also like a whole how to shoot like checklist. Well, it was really. It was a lot. It was just a lot. But the main thing that bothered me about this design um, and kind of launched into the next stage of the design was the set, because I felt like this is too static. The way that a 
that an actual um, film works is that um, you know you every day every every hour is very dynamic we're like unless you're shooting one shot that whole day like you're gonna be moving stuff around you're gonna be moving the set you're gonna be moving equipment and this is all this, oh you would just slot it into this you know place on the on the board that corresponded to the picture and it was the same every time it was just that oh one time you need only one light and another time you might need you know like a different number of lights like wow how how dynamic and so I started thinking like well you know, I've already got these like set, these like uh, recipes, I started calling them. So I need an actor, I need two lights and a microphone. And here, the pieces are already cubes. I started thinking, well, what if it was like, you know, if this, what's the light is two, if this is two lights, and then if the actor has to be next to it, like these are already kind of squares. They could already be kind of arranged in a, a pattern and that's when I struck upon the idea of the grid so um, I think this is where the real magic of the game comes in in my opinion it's like what the, makes it really unique the like Tetris yeah the bit of Tetris the puzzle um, how are you gonna make the grid work as well as uh, assign the correct dice it does give this feeling again it's another place where the abstraction of the grid, especially how it ended up, like this is actually much more like simulationist, where it like this, okay, you put these set pieces, you arrange them, it like blocks off certain things. But the more abstract final version actually feels more similar to what it's right. like to make a film, even though it's an abstraction. So this, you know, this design taught me a lot about how like, just because you have something that looks more accurate to life, doesn't mean that it actually is more accurate to life um, in the way that it feels to play, right? And that, like the feeling comes from can come from abstract components, um, right. actually. Kind of just how the previous version had these backdrop images, but it didn't really add to the gameplay in terms of your imagination. These ones, mm -hmm. oh no, the with the long ones, yeah. yeah, yeah. It just like it, yeah, exactly. You didn't, you weren't able to like uh, put that together in your brain, uh, in, in your imagination as much. Um, so here you can see it's already starting to take shape in terms of the, the way that the, um, the board is laid out. Um, there were, uh, the problem cards are here. There's still no ideas. You still got your, you know, you got your budget and schedule just on, on here. Um, the thing, you got your quality track. Oh, did that get taken off here? Hmm. I think there was a version where it, it wasn't there. That's the business version. But one thing that is here is that I wanted there to be a reason to edit the film. You know, once the scenes come into the editing room, um, initially there was really no reason why you would put one in front of the other one or not. And so for the first time here, I have shots, scenes which um, interact with each other. Mm -hmm. So you have scenes which refer to other scenes. And my hope was that the placement of those scenes would mean that you would want to rearrange them. So here, this shot says, oh, if it's number five, the previous shot gains one movie ticket, which at the time was like mainstream mm -hmm. quality. Um, and this one says number one has reverse effect, which like. <laughs> it is number one. Right, so it is number one. So you would think, okay, well, we better assign our director here to rearrange the shots in the edit and maybe, you know, we could put this one as the last scene because it's like the final scene where they're all like cheersing, you know? Right. Um, this shot actually made it more or less to the end, but even has the three actors right. in the final game. This one didn't though because one of the reasons I, one of the things I found out as the game went on that the, what makes a scene interesting in the editing room as far as like, because here I even had the little story points, you know, because of that uh, and ever since then. Um, because of that, he made a stir fry. Like right. it's not a, it's does it's not an interesting enough action to count as like a, a sort of story point. And these scene cards really wanted to be like story points. Um, this one is a little bit because of that. You know, they had a party, um, and so I, I started to figure out slowly. Like this one's great. This is the best. this one definitely ended up in the final one because of that. You know, you got punched in the face. Nice. Um, it works anywhere. Once upon a time, you got punched in the face. Or, uh, but one day, 
you know. And ever yeah. since then, he just went around punching people. Like it just works because it's an active scene. It's a scene that with like a like a moment of of action. So from the very beginning, there was five scenes, and yeah, that number fun. never changed. Right. This like I think is, it makes a great scene, but it's. It, it doesn't work in the context of other scenes. Like it doesn't make, it doesn't feel like a story because it's like shocked by something, but like shocked by what? So anyway, I had these, um, these, this red text is like where the scenes would interact with each other. Um, okay, number one through three, go one in the direction you choose. It's, it, it's a bit complicated, but the, but the, like the kernel of the idea is here for the first time where it's like, oh, um, this, this could, these scenes, the arrangement of them in the, in the editing room can impact each other and it gives you a reason to shoot or like edit, which I think was, uh, was useful. Hmm. Here's the quality tracker, it's in the middle. You have two different quality types. Oh yeah, here you are. So the, um, the movie ticket means you're making the films more popular and the, um, the award means we're making an award winner. Now I was trying to make like a, I was trying to be clever here and make a, make a statement that like when you're making films, you can either make money or make a good film. Yeah, you can either like be poor and make a good film, or you can go for popularity, make money, and and it's crap. So the idea was that these scenes, like if you have a lot of punching, like oh, it's gonna make it. Oh, it's you know everyone loves punching, so like right. the the mainstream audience will love that. Um, whereas you know something like this, like tortured guy in the shower, which ended up in the final uh, game. Right. Well, that's a that's that's an every award. Uh, award-winning film has got to be like a tortured scene in the shower. Um, and this was in the design, you'll see this even when we get to the physical ones, like this was in the design for a long time until I was playing with a filmmaker friend of mine and I was explaining the rules and I was explaining this and he goes, oh, so you can't make Gladiator. And I was like, and it's not, I don't even really like Gladiator, like mm -hmm. I don't, as a movie, but I, I, I saw his point, which was like, there are plenty, there are movies out there that are both popular and win a lot of awards. I mean, Lord of the Rings, like, you yeah. know, that make a ton of money and win lots of awards. And it's not that I, I still thought it was kind of a funny, um, like, like commentary right. on the film industry, but I didn't want, I could foresee, as soon as he said that, I could foresee myself, like, at a convention teaching someone how to play and, like, smart ass comments coming all the time of, like, well, what about. Yeah. You turn to the king. And it's just like, I just didn't want to deal with that. So eventually I scrapped this and it became more of an abstract quality meter. But um, yes, this was, this was where it first came in. Hmm. You saw the trailers here and the gear, um, gear truck. So uh -huh. there's still that, the multi-step, uh, multiple steps to, to actually place the dice. Yeah, there's and so the many dice. Look at all these dice. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> Because I remember the issue being that you didn't, act, you couldn't get the dice that you needed to actually shoot the movie. So the solution was just to add more dice. Yeah. And because uh, also you would lose dice over time. Uh, right. But, yes. Um, but so even though there were problems and it was very complicated, it was pretty stable to the point where I was able to start bringing in. Start. I, I built the first physical version. So this is great. This is my. <laughs> that's props. Uh, I have this. So, the very first physical version of the game was all made on recycled cardboard. Old cardboard. Here. <laughs> this. So this um, was on this piece of Amazon shipping crate. This was before I discovered pizza boxes, which are white. <laughs> they came later. Um, so I had this. Here, you can hold that on yours. Oh, my quality is pretty bad. It's all right. Yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> so you get that's like old. Uh, there you go. You can hold it there. Yeah. So I had the. So it's all. So this is where like set grid already became a bit more, um, a bit less abstract. You had uh, the parts of the, of the of the um, set and like the different actions that uh, you could take were kind of there. Um, and the cards were here written on little index cards. You can see. So the red ones were the, were the problems. 
And you, they, they already, if you bring it over here, mm -hmm. they already would come up. You can see all oh, the problem deck goes here, and like these cards would be on the top, and the scene cards would come out on the, on the sides. They were called shot cards. And the set is the same as it is now? Yeah. Like the same proportions? Yeah, the same everything. This is the idea cards. Um, and I had these shot cards, these scene cards here, which are starting to get a bit more, a bit more complex. Um, it has the grid layout. And I, I worked on this one for a long time. And this is where I started to test with people in person. And I could see that it was starting to get, it was starting to work. Now, well, there's one thing here, there's one big part of this that's not in the final version, as you can tell, and that's the crew mood. So the crew mood goes here from I remember this. Uh, stressed, exhausted, bitter, up to playful, motivated, and inspired. And so the crew mood came with this big fat crew mood dice. And you would literally roll this dice at the start of the turn, along with all the other dice, more dice, and it would fall in one of these kind of funny phases. And you would slot that in, and that's where you could get more idea cards or where you could get more problems. That's where it would come in. And I gotta say, like I, this was the mechanic that I miss the most from having to cut out of the design because it made sense to me that the the mood of the crew that you're working with would have an impact on how your film is coming out. That's actually a really important part of filmmaking, or really any kind of creative production that involves a team, is morale, how they're how people are feeling about it. And I I really liked that it was you know that the crew was being represented they were being given a face they weren't just faceless dice that you were throwing they actually had they had feelings they had um, opinions about how this production is going because if you you know if you don't take care of your crew on a film set it can be very long hours it can be grueling it can be a lot of work it's exhausting um, it's it's stressful um, and so it, it's, it's a lot of work to keep the crew morale up and so what I wanted here, and it wasn't completely random, like you could mitigate this role. This would be in the morning that you'd come in and everyone would be bitter and you'd be like, oh great, that means you have to draw one problem. Or they'd be, they'd be playful. And it's like, well, this round you can ignore problems. And then you could play idea cards and you could take actions, like here there's an action snack table. So you can assign dice to change the crew mood to playful or motivated um, by you know, getting some good snacks, which is the best way to motivate the crew. And that, I really liked the way that that what that said about the film industry, what that said about creative production, what it said about um, uh, working together. And, and however, as you can imagine, like mechanically rolling a dice to see whether you get something good or something bad is pretty crap. <laughs> it's pretty bad design practice. Um, Cause you would have a plan in your head and then depending on how the dice rolled, it would either be really easy to do what you wanted or really difficult. Yeah, it would be completely random. I mean, already roll camera, I've got you know has gotten accusations of it. <laughs> you know, you roll dice to determine what you're going to do. It it you know you can roll a dice and roll exactly what you need, and it's like, well, I didn't have to do anything. It was just the it was just the roll of the dice. Um, so that yeah, that can uh, that that ended up being the reason why it got cut. But it was it's something I really liked, and I I wouldn't you know if there was some other way I could bring it in in the future, or if I do a future game where it's similar to World Camera that like involves creative production, I would probably want to see if I can bring something like that back in now that I'm a smarter, wiser designer. Yes, the crew mood. It's big dice. Um, the other thing that it, that I came up with while I was here this stage of the production was um, having the scene cards be double-sided so that you know one side it's this unfinished sketch side and then when you flip it over it uh, is like a finished colored side and when that when I struck upon that idea I, I, uh, I com it. committed myself to doing two sets of artwork for every single card <laughs> that's what I've done in the past in the B-movie expansion there's so many so many scene cards I mean there's no real mechanic behind it but it is very satisfying to see the that your the sketch become you know part of the movie you know finish scene yeah i think that that does it always bothered me that in the editing room you'd have these sketches you know yeah. it was like it's not really a finished film how what else can we do oh well obviously there's another side yeah it does show that transition yeah exactly um it's a small thing and it costs me a lot of work in terms of artwork but i think it adds a lot to the design 
Um, and then the other thing is that I changed it so that the, I still wanted the editing scenes in the editing room to impact each other. And then I, I had, came up with this system where like on the left side of the card of the finished side, it would like, they would stack in such a way that it would like refer. So this one says like, oh, this one below, the scene below here is reversed in terms of what it offers. So this offers, you know, as I said before, it's like in the direction of Blockbuster. So this card here would reverse this to award. So you could shoot this scene if you wanted to, shoot this scene if you wanted this one to give you more awards instead of more Blockbuster. Or like this one would give, you know, negative one here. So this would award you three in the direction of Blockbuster, but if you have this one, it reduces that by one. And I really like this because it was an iconographic way of like, having the scenes work together. But I remember you pointed out, mm -hmm. it's too hard to read. Like it's too hard, it's just too crunchy. It's too much to think about right. of like where the scene's gonna go. But it was in pursuit of kind of making editing actually be uh, uh, a requirement. Yeah, meaningful and important. And I think at this point in the design, this is when it's like the most, like most mechanically impactful. The system I have now where, um, which came out when I wanted the script cards to, um, to impact the final quality and have a way of like, um, I wanted a bit of, re of replayability. So when the, um, I wanted a way that like quality could be determined differently each time. And I heard about this game, uh, Isle of Sky, where you, it's like a tile building, like a pattern building game and you compete for points. But the, um, at the beginning you draw these four tiles that are scoring tiles that tell you how, which patterns are going to score in which way. And they're different every time. And they're different amounts. And I like this because it meant like every time you play, you're going to pull out a completely different uh, way that you can score. And so I thought like, well, it'd be kind of cool for this too if there were different arrangements of scenes in the editing room, which would give you different types of quality. And that's where I struck upon the scenes can have different colors that can correspond to their mood or like their emotional tone content. Mm -hmm. And they can... Uh, and then the script cards can involve the arrangement of the right. and editing room. Do you remember playing this one? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I think I really didn't like the crew dice. I understand the meaning behind, like the, the reason for it. Yeah. It's being created in, in terms of like the actual, what it's like to be on the set. But I didn't like that. It felt like each round was in the hands of the crew dice. You mean the crew mood dice? The crew mood dice, yeah. Well, I remember playing with our stepmom, uh, Monica, and she, she was like, oh, this is great, this is fun. And I said, do you feel like, it was with that version, um, do you feel like you're in control? And right. she said, no, it's totally random. And I thought, well, that's terrible. <laughs> that's really not, that's, that can't be where this goes. So I was, in, I was trying to uh, find ways of working in more player agency over randomness, which again taught me a lot about game design. I think it would have been, if I hadn't been working on a game with, with dice in it, I think it might have taken me longer to figure that out. I'd like to learn that lesson. So this is where I discovered pizza boxes, <laughs> which are white. Um, and I had to go through, I would go through the recycling and find one that had the least amount of grease stains on them to <laughs> build my games on. It still has the crew mood, as you can see. Um, but I'm trying to fit everything on the board here, at least much as possible. This is where other actions appeared on the board as well. Well, this one actually had, um, there were cards that you could put on top of here. So as you can see here, they're like empty offices. So these were supposed to be the offices that did the different things, kind of like the spaceship in um, deep space. And there were cards that would go on top of these, which had additional actions, and you could unlock them. So basically during the, during the game, you could put a dice on here and it would flip over and you'd have a new action. And the idea was there would be different ones each time, but you wouldn't know what they were. Again, it's randomness. Like you could have exactly what you need or you could have right. something that does nothing for you. But um, this, this kind of comes back in the expansion with the gear, uh, yeah. the equipment. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that came back having additional action spaces that are more in your control. Right. But of course, seeing them from the beginning allows you to make a much more informed decision about whether to use them, how right. to use them instead of it just being a random, uh, random pullout. 
Uh, one thing that I'll mention that at this stage was already really clear, which um, now that I'm designing more games, I'm, I'm, I, I realize I took a bit for granted at the time, which is that the tension curve of roll camera is really strong. So at this point in the design already, there was this, when you play the game, it's much more like it is now where you, um, you start out with lots of time, lots of budget, and you're like, this is going to be fine. We're going to have no problem. We can shoot. We can build that. Oh, yeah, we've got the money to like buy that extra thing, or we'll shoot this expensive scene, no problem. And then as the game goes on, you get to, you know, you realize like, we've only shot two scenes, and we're almost completely out of money. Like, how are we possibly going to get through this? Which, again, is, uh, and then you kind of, at that point in the game, you have to work really hard to, like, mm -hmm. suddenly think through all your options. You look at your idea cards, you look at all the options available to you on your player board and everywhere, and you start to think, like, okay, how are we going to solve this? Which, again, is very similar to filmmaking. Right. In actual filmmaking, you start out, the first day is always super, like, lazy, and everyone's like, yeah, we got this, it's going to be easy, no problem, we'll spend... 30 takes on one yeah. shot, uh, we'll spend all day, I will get it, pick it up tomorrow, no problem. And then you get halfway through and you realize like, we're not, we're like losing time. We haven't shot enough of the movie yet. Yeah. We can't be doing this. We gotta like keep it together. There's, and so There's a point where it's like halfway through, you're halfway through your time, halfway through your money, and you haven't done anything. Yeah. You just started basically. Yeah. And I, I think that's the, that's, when people say that there's a feeling of movie making, I think that's what they're talking about, mm. that like stress. So I think that's been nailed quite well. Where at the beginning you don't feel it. Yeah. I mean, the problems do come up at the beginning in the current version. Yeah. So you know there's stuff going on, but it's like, ah, it's not going to be a big deal. Right. And then by the end you're just going like, oh, we don't have enough dice, we don't have enough time, we don't have my work, and we squeeze out one extra dollar. Yeah. And that was already evident in this version, and I wanted to make sure that that wasn't lost somehow. I didn't know what I was doing that like made that happen. But I didn't want it. I didn't want to lose it. It was. It was already at this balance where, like, and often you would get to the end and you would just barely make it through, which is also still yeah. uh, evident in the game. And I just wanted to try to preserve that. Movie demand says, "What if progress or, or spending money on them would have influenced the mood?" I think that's how the mood dice worked originally. It was there were problems and ideas that would influence them or set them up for the next round. Um, if I remember correctly, you could like keep the mood where it was for the for one more turn, or you could say next turn it'll be at this point, or you would have to re-roll it completely. Yeah. Um, he also says, "Note to myself: order more pizza for my first board." Game. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's the great part. It's a, that's a business expense. That's tax deductible. <laughs> um, Yeah, so that's the that's one of the notes I got at this point in the game. This is from our other brother, Killian. His uh, his girlfriend, Aiden. We were playing it in Ireland. Remember, family trip. Played a lot of roll camera because we were in a castle, uh, and it was rainy, and for a week, played a lot of roll camera. And I remember she played it. Uh, it was her and Killian that were playing it together. And she said, it's fun, it's good. Why is this for more than one person? And I remember thinking like, ooh, that's a great question. Because you could just play this by yourself. There's really no reason why you had to have another person there. And it became, and that was where I learned the lesson of like co-op co games, which I hadn't played many of before. I'd played Pandemic. And I think this is why when I, um, was designing it, I thought it wasn't gonna be an issue because in Pandemic also you can kind of do it by yourself. I mean, I guess different players have different hands of cards, but they don't really hide those hands. Um, and I guess each player has different uh, powers they can use too. But at the time I just thought, well, maybe it won't be a problem. And when she said that, I realized, that was when I really realized like this, this needs to change. It can't just be, there needs to be a reason why, there needs, you need to feel in some way that you are contributing. Right. That each person is making their own contribution to, to the game. Um, and I was glad she said that because that's when the player boards came back in. If you remember in the original, original tabletop simulator version I showed you at the beginning, there was like these rolls that came out, and then those were discarded, and they didn't come back in the design until after this note that I got. And I thought, like, oh, this is a place I can bring back both the player roles where you can actually like do, have your own set of actions that are unique to you. And it helps solve this problem of the like different the randomness of these cards that came out, because it gave additional action slots 
and it gave additional variety because if you played with a different role, you would have different actions that were in play. But it wasn't just randomly sorted. It was something you could choose at the top and then you could work through as part of the challenge of the game. Um, so the player boards, yeah, that came from her note. Uh, and I'm gonna, let's hop back to TTS. And I'll show you Ah, so this one, <laughs> this is funny. Well, I'll show you the physical version first because uh, it's kind of a funny thing here. Um, and I'm not sure why I did it this way. But so I'm trying to remember what the old player boards look like. <laughs> this is the set at some point. I guess this, I was experimenting with like different shapes, different patterns and shapes. Um, and this one was not a pizza box. Oh, there's two sides. Oh, that's what it is. This was the film school. So I was building a, I'm going to get to this a little bit later, but I was trying to build a simpler version of it because I was worried that coming off of the very simple card game, I was worried that people who played it would be overwhelmed by the rules. I've since learned that real camera is quite light on the spectrum of uh, game complexity, but I wanted to have like a simple like dummies version or something you could play with kids maybe because it's a bit complicated to play with like 10 and under, unless they're really good at board games. The old player boards. Oh no, that's, that's a bit later in the zoom. <laughs> so this had the set pieces. I mean, it's all here, pretty much. Here they are. Producer's trailer. Uh, and you would put your like, I mean, it's not that different, really, from how it is now. Uh, it says what you do on your turn. Here's the director's trailer. Oh, that also the producer's trailer. Yeah, because then they had different characters, right? Oh, maybe you put different roles on it? Yeah, I don't remember. There's a director. You got gear. I had equipment cards, uh, which, again, came back in the expansion. But at the time, I thought, like, oh, this could be an alternative to ideas where it's something you can use in an ongoing, like, repeat use. Um, but those ended up being too similar in powers to ideas, so I just folded everything into the idea deck. Um, and it was just one less thing to worry about. Where did you get this idea that the all the cards kind of sit at the edge of the... It the came from uh, Deep Space, D6. Because in that game, in order to conserve space, it's a very, very small box game. Right. So he had, the cards would come out and they would all sit on the side of the board. Mm -hmm. And I thought, like, oh, that's genius. And then you don't have to have this huge board. Um, you can kind of let it take up its own space. But eventually it felt like the editing room and the, and the storyboard should be actual board slots. Right. But the problems didn't really need their own space. So what's funny about this is I literally scanned the physical version and like remade it in Tabletop Simulator. Why did I do this? Why did I do this? It's the same version here. Man, I couldn't tell you. I don't even know how much I'm going to play this, but here's where the set pieces started to take these, like... Looks great. Looks like it has a nice natural feel to it. <laughs> it's, it's just, you can even see, like, the dirt and the hairs on it and stuff. Like, what the heck was I thinking? And here you can see the early player boards. Right, yeah. Um, here, idea, I mean, that's a surviving idea. Oh, wow, I even scanned these. Why? It's got the lines on them and stuff. Yeah. My, <laughs> note cards. Why would I do this? Maybe I just, there were so many pieces and I felt like. So here's an early script. Extremely Lonely Ape Woman. It's a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good <laughs> title that didn't make the cut. Um, and this is pretty similar to how it ended up being, right? Like you have the scenes have different colors. Yeah. Um, here I just like literally drew an outline. Oh, this is going to be a green scene. This is going to be a purple scene. And then... Right. Purple, green, you know, next to each other, minus one quality. Here's the quality. Oh, here's so bad, it's great. It's the first iteration. I think it was on the first one, actually. So mediocre garbage. The very, very first one. Had, yeah. Or, like, first dice one. It was a cult classic. Right. It was at the bottom, and then, uh, yeah. So here, a cult following smash hit. I was always surprised at the events, the... Uh Essen convention, how much people enjoyed the idea of having a so bad it's great movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I don't think I've seen any movies that are so bad they're great. Yeah, really? I just think they're terrible. You have seen Sharknado? I haven't seen Sh- well, I have seen Snakes on a Plane. So there you go. Kind of <laughs> so bad it's great. I mean, I wouldn't call it great. It's no. so bad it's entertaining. Yeah. Um, I don't really hate watch movies either. So, yes, but I do like the idea. I think people people always mention Sharknado. They're like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, you can make Sharknado. I do remember this in the time in the trackers where you get problems and ideas through progression. Right, so spending money could be strategically useful if you wanted to use it to draw some more ideas. Mm-hmm. This ended up being way too few though. It wasn't, it, the idea churn wasn't enough. Right. Because the idea cards are so specific, oftentimes they don't apply to the exact situation you're in. And this was a problem I had for a long time of like how do I make it so that the idea cards actually work towards the strategy. So here's me trying to go like, oh well maybe, you know, maybe you, I liked this that you problems increase the the more time you've lost, but again, it's punishing you for losing. Yeah, for making progress. Which, you know, the current system is just draw one every turn. And that's not, that's pretty much the same, in a way it's the same thing. You're being punished for just moving through the game, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel as bad because it feels right. more true to life. It's like, well, of course, every day there's new problems. You know? Something new we have to deal with. And the nice thing was uh, drawing at the start of the turn means it's something you can address, something you can plan to deal with rather than it being like a, like a surprise punishment. Because this, this could happen at the end of your turn. You know? In fact, it, it would almost always would. That yeah. Like, oh, our, my turn's over, and now I'm going to have to draw two problems, and that could be something, maybe it's your last turn. Yeah. You're trying, to, you're trying to win the game, and then suddenly it just comes up randomly, which is no good. Um, something I was going to mention about the... Ah, yes. Also, the problems coming up every turn is easy to remember from a player's point of view. It's just the first thing you do is you draw a problem, then you roll the dice and go for it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Whereas this, I mean, this also I think is kind of easy to it's visual. Yeah, I always try. If you pass it, like if you skip it, does it does that activate? Or, or like if you lose money and then gain it again, do you gain right. two ideas? Like this, yeah, this became that, a problem. Yeah. Um, the and the main thing that I was mentioning earlier that was kind of an issue was the pitch meeting. So initially, when this was called the pitch meeting, the way that the idea cards would work is you'd take this action, and you would. And anyone who wanted to pitch an idea could, and then and that was it. And it was a bit, it sounds very simple and easy, but it was very muddy. Because it was like, you know, if, if I forced people to play the idea cards, uh, then people would always pick idea cards they didn't want or didn't need. Because inevitably, if, if you had the initiative to play the pitch meeting, right. then most likely it was your idea. Yeah. And if someone, even if someone else says, oh, I have a good idea, then you're going to trash one. You're going to be like, okay, good, you have an idea, let's use yours. Why do I even need, why do we need to pitch this meeting at all? And if I said if I said it was optional, then you'd say I'd say to you, call the pitch meeting, I have a good idea, we played that one idea, done. Right. It was very like very unsatisfying. And I posted this problem to the BGG forums actually, and somebody mentioned, they said, what if you always play three and then you have to always do these three things? Always Spend one round now, activate one right now, always trash one, and always save one for later. And that third I, that third part, always save one for later, right. was what really made the idea cards work because now they're not just instant effects. Now you have the potential of, um, you know, here there's no to-do list. So later on, that's where that appeared because it was like, oh, now I have an idea that might not be the best thing for now, right. but maybe we could use it in the future and then we play it, and there's, there, sometimes there's a surprise of like, well, that's a way better idea to do right now. Right. I'll save mine for later, or I'll trash mine. This one we drew from the deck if we're playing two-player yeah. was actually way better. So that really brought the ideas um, system together, and that's the part that really feels like very interactive for a co-op game. Most co-op games have this problem of, um, you know, you can kind of sit it out, mm-hmm. and you can like, wait for someone else to decide what to do, or you, um, it, in this point, when I was playtesting, a lot of times people would just take their turn and pass the dice, and that was the end of the, the turn, and it was like, oh, we don't really need to talk. And as soon as that came up, where it was like, oh, do you have an idea? Who has an idea? Oh, I've got a great idea. Call a pitch meeting. We can do right. this, that. And it felt like you're active even when it's not your turn. There's a great feeling of, like, you have an idea that solves a certain problem, or, like, 
uh, for example, there's a problem on the board that needs to be solved, and you so you pitch a meeting, and somebody else look when they look at the board, what the issues that they see is oh we're low on money, so they come up with a with a money um, solving idea, and then right. there's that oh actually that's that's pretty good too, and then the, the third random one which could be potentially better than either one, so or for other players yeah. 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 Yeah, it works out really well. Especially because you can't talk about it, but you just, you can say you have an idea that might help in that situation. And the key thing there was that you, none of them come back to you. But like, once that idea is out there, you know yeah. one of them is going to get trashed. There's always a little bit of tension of like, uh, do, is. Is this the right time? Right. Is this the right time to play? It is really good. Is this something we could save? But I risk trashing it forever or we risk not using it or maybe we use it now and it's not as effective as it could be later so it like adds all these layers to the what you're thinking about it um, yeah but at this time it was pretty pretty binary right you know use it or don't um, so then there's one last version here I wanted to show you. Ooh, this this I just want to show you this pizza box art. This is way better. <laughs> but, Ooh, I remember that one. <laughs> than this one. I mean, what? You know, ugh. generic pizza or uh, oven, you know, brick oven pizza. I mean, I mean, yeah. Come on, look at that. It's way better. He's got a guy on it. He's smiling. He's proud of his work. <laughs> Ooh, I hope a robot could have made this one. But maybe that pizza just maybe it's just a an oven that's on fire. There's not even any pizza in this picture. But this one, look at that big pizza. Oh yeah, it's tasty. It's good graphic design. You know, actually, this is something I learned from filmmaking as an aside. People are always drawn to other people. So like images of people are what we as human beings are attracted to way more than any, like you can have the most interesting object in the world, but like a person in the scene of a, of a shot will, um, will immediately make you look towards that person and like will ma immediately make the scene more relatable. So where I learned this was um, there was a scene where in one of a, a film that I made, where there was a sign. I needed to show a, a sign. And there, was, there was some writing on the sign that, um, that needed to convey some information about what was going to happen in a later scene. Um, it was like one of those signs with the movable white letters. And we had the idea on set. Let's have, it was boring. It was a very boring shot. But it needed, it was important that people read that information. I didn't want to have a super close up because actually the character looking at it is looking at it from a car passing by. Mm -hmm. So I thought like, how are they going to, how are we going to convey this information that's on this sign while the character is far away. So what I did was I had, let's well, let's have another person there putting the letters on the sign. Right, makes you look better. So it suddenly drew your attention to exactly what this person is doing and it drew your attention to that text and they have their hand out so you're like looking at where, what they're doing and where that's going. It was, it was, a, it was a really good lesson. Um, and immediately like your attention tracks there. So, I mean, that's a good lesson too for graphic design also in games. Like, if you want to draw someone's attention to something, you know, this pizza box is the winner. <laughs> yeah, oh man. You know what else is something I learned, speaking of graphic design, is, and this was the, this was the last time that I used a very um, Spartan, layout in terms of like it's very minimalist uh, graphic design here on on the board and I'm you're gonna see in this next version I start adding artwork and the reason is that I found people were having a hard time when you look at this you just when you just sit down and look at that like it looks like work it looks like a graph like graph paper right. it's it, too abstract it, it, it is it's very like um, it's just a lot of icons, a lot of text. It's white on black. It's very like hard to read, and I, I started to realize like I want I that a lot of the problems that people were having with the game, with the way that it worked, confusion about what goes where or like what they can do on their turn, uh, and they were they the players were attributing this to the game's too hard or it's too abstract or it's too um, it, it, there's too much going on. There's too many mechanics. And I realized, like, actually, it's not that there's too many mechanics. It's that they all look the same. <laughs> everything here looks the same as everything else. So it's, it's really hard for your brain to parse this and go, what should I be prioritizing? What are my options? Where do I, where, what can I do with this? Mm -hmm. And so it was a really good lesson in graphic design as a user interface um, and how it actually impacts performance and p impacts um, decision making and impacts ideas that you come up with. 
it impacts the gameplay, really. So I honestly don't know how other companies do this where, you know, because the amount of graphic design passes that I did with this game are numerous. And if I had to pay a graphic designer to do all that work, or artist, mm -hmm. the number of times I redid the artwork on all the cards, um, it would be too much. But if I hadn't done that, and I wouldn't have seen the back and forth, because as soon as I put in graphic design onto the board, it started to impact how the game played. So here, for the first time, I'm playing around with like uh, how the game board could look in terms of its artwork. It's got like a little table, and it's like the storyboard looks like. I mean, this part was kept the frame, but it was like a cork board. And actually, here, hold that. The shot cards, when they came in, they were also on cork board. Oh, this one's blank, but the pile of notes and the copy stain. So like they, it sat on here, and there's like tape. So it really gave the idea that like, oh, this is like pinned to this board. Um, and when I put all this artwork together, I started to think like, what kind of art do I have here? Initially, my plan was, oh, I'll have, it'll look like a film set from the top. It'll be like an isometric view of a film set. Um, and that quickly, I gave up on that because it, it, there was too many lines and there was too many, it, it was too much too confusing. Again, it was doing the opposite of what I wanted the good graphic design to do, which was focus your attention on what's important. So I started to put in these little characters around here but already when I started to put in the graphic design and it would impact how people were playing the game, that would impact the balance because as soon as it became easier to parse what it is you can do on your turn, the game became easier. And so I had to go back and rebalance the game, a lot of the mechanics to account for the fact that now it's easier to tell what you can or can't do on your turn. So this is what I mean that like, I, like if I wasn't the one doing all this work myself of like graphic design and artwork and game design, I, I don't know how those those departments, so to speak, would talk to each other in a way. I mean, obviously, if you're a professional, and you're very good at this, and I'm sure you have lots of meetings and ways of communicating this information. But um, for me, it was really, really valuable that I was able to do this back and forth all myself. It's pretty close to what it is now. Mm -hmm. I, got I ended up getting rid of like this. Um, I mean, even like in the service of minimalism, I have gotten criticism on the roll camera board that it is very, it's very abstract. It's very like simplistic. Mm -hmm. And part of that was, I mean, it did have like, a, you know, here's this like little paper clip. It's like holding this in and here this, um, it's like a, um, I had a whole like notepad thing going here and there's like a pencil up here. And I wanted it to be very evocative, but it ended up just getting in the way. It ended up being artwork that, um, interfered and maybe you know as I get better at artwork I'd be able to do something that would still feel like you're actually looking and holding documents and paperwork that actually like is filmmaking gear and also not have that interfere visually with the, with the game and all the icons and all the text and all the graphics that need to be on there but anyway at the time it wasn't really able to do all those things at once I want to show you something do you remember this uh, yeah this is the clipboard. <laughs> um, this was how, when I got the, I don't know whose idea this was, but I, at some point I decided to, I needed the space on the board. I wonder if it's this version already. Yeah, I didn't have space for the, the quality, or sorry, the time and budget, because the quality went next to the editing room, but I didn't have space for the schedule and budget on the game board. Um, and also, I remembering this now, there was a problem where people were not remembering to advance the schedule on their turn. Right, yeah. Which is very important for the game, that like the time, the time goes down. And so I thought, well, if you were holding this on your turn, and anyway, I needed a turn reminder, so I thought, I'll combine these things. This is what you have to do on your turn, but there's only one of them. Mm -hmm. And it has the budget and the schedule printed on it. So now if it's my turn, I have this in front of me. And so before I pass to the next, I, I look at this, oh, what am I doing on my turn? Oh, I have to, you know, here it says advance the schedule. Okay, I do that. And now I pass to the next player. Mm -hmm. And now it's part of their turn that they do this. So this really helped like put it in the player's hands so that they, it's something that they have to like interface with immediately. Um, now, as you get better at the game, then obviously one person usually will like take it, but you, it, it's in your habit now, you remember like, oh yes, we have to do this. I have to move the schedule every turn. And I really like this. 
I call it the clip. I call it the clipboard because it looks like a little clipboard, and it would be printed on board. And there's clips on it. It's like perfect. It, would, it was. I was so happy with how this turned out. I mean, it's even in the ki original Kickstarter video. I had it all the way up until the um, nearly the final version. In fact, Rado's original run through. Um, still, he still has these clips. And it it didn't work out because. I couldn't find plastic clips that would work. Um, it oftentimes, because I wanted this to be a board, I didn't want this to be a card. It's not a clip card, it's a clip board, so I wanted it to be thick uh, uh, board um, to really feel really hefty. And the, all the plastic clips that I could find were made for card, or if they were made for a board, they were either too tight or too loose, which is a constant problem. I, and I was looking up a lot of games. There are games like, um, I think the Forbidden Desert, like the Forbidden series, where there's there's clips on cards, if I remember correctly, maybe even on a board, and they, they're always loose or like Betrayal. I think there were people saying there were trackers that were sliders on a, a, a plastic clips on a board, and it makes sense because if you make it too tight, it will scratch the artwork. Yeah. If you make it too loose, they will just slide off, and or, so it was. An, or they would get more loose the more you used them, and then it would become useless. Exactly. So this was a real problem and I was kind of like freaking out about it. And somebody on the Kickstarter campaign suggested, well, have you thought about dials? This was after the campaign finished and I had mentioned in an update, like, I don't know really what to do about this, um, this problem. And they said, so the dial, they pointed me to the dials in Gloomhaven. Um, and at first I was not really that excited about using Gloomhaven dials because they, no, no I don't think I have prototypes. Um, the Gloomhaven dials, uh, I, it's just that I like the clipboard. It's a clip, it's a board, there are clips right. on it. <laughs> I like this too much. But eventually I was like, okay, well, it doesn't hurt to like draw something and like threw it together. I thought, well, I could do like film reels maybe. And I sent it to the factory and they sent back a prototype and it was actually great. And it was, the dials were really tight. And I mean, as anyone has seen the, in the final game, they're really satisfying to use. And I was able to solve the problem of what to do about the difficulty um, so in the dials on the back side, you can set, because here, if you can see, I had like easy way up here and normal here, but it didn't allow for different player counts. So I would have had to balance the game for different player counts in different ways, um, some other way that maybe more or less problems or something like this. Yeah. Um, but with the dials, you can flip it over. I guess I could have done that here too, technically. But you flip them over and you can set the difficulty um, and then when you flip it over, it's all set to go. So I'm really happy with how the dials turned out in the end, even though I like yeah. I like the pun of the clipboards better. Ruby the Man says it works great too. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was Forbidden Desert. I guess they used the clip had a clipboard. I think the dials just allow you to, you know, it works all the time. It works for the same purpose, and you can use it forever, and it won't get um, run down. Or if you lose a clip, like then what? Yeah, yeah. So or one breaks. Yeah, then you're just like putting cubes on it or something. Yeah, terrible. In fact, the reason why in Gloomhaven in the original version they had um, you tracked your health and your mana with cubes, right. and it's just like it's so easy to knock, run into it. I mean, even in the original versions here on TTS, you could see the um, they were tracked with cubes on the board, and it's just like if you knock it, it's like oh, what did we have? How many was our budget and schedule? And that's actually really important information. Right. Um, it's really critical that that does not move. Um, so it really just solved so many problems all at once with the dials. Um, so that is, is that all the drafts I want to show? Well, then I ended up printing, here's some early player boards. And those are pretty close to the final products. This is, this is the same art I used in the, um, these characters that I used in the very, very first. No, it can't be, is it? Yeah, they look the same. Slightly different backgrounds, I think. I'm going to check one sec. Let's, let's have a look. Um, so the... You can't see, but these are stickers that have been back. stuck on. I don't know where you got a blue cube sticker. Oh uh, yeah, look, here's the director's in the same pose in this very early version as in the final. Um, huh. 
Would you look at that? <laughs> this one's not the same. <laughs> this guy. Um, yeah, so then uh, here's some old gear cards. Grip truck. Call sheet. Script. So this, this version is very close to, but again, I did the artwork. So I redid the, I've already redone the artwork on the scene cards twice at this point. Um, and here I've done it again, and then I will redo it again for the final version of, of Roll Camera. I mean, this is the luxury of being your own artist is you can overwork yourself. Um, oh, I have the old dice here. Those stickers on them. Those dirty, these filthy, filthy dice. I don't have the original original ones because I kept removing the stickers and taping over them over and over again. Why did you pick that color? Um, honestly, like I think it just stuck because remember the original equipment dice mm -hmm. were um, were so orange and then they were like yeah. So the original dice were yellow. Um, yellow and then teal as well. Yeah. So they were like yellow and teal, and I wanted them to be yellow and teal because I wanted two opposite colors so that it would be clear like the different types of dice you would be using. Mm -hmm. um, and so the teal, you know, teal and yellow are on opposite sides of the color spectrum. And then when I got rid of the um, one of sets of dice, I didn't want the ideas, which were yellow. I didn't want people to associate too much the yellow ideas with the yellow dice. And there wasn't really any other component that was teal colored. Right. So it stuck. I, it was always one of those things that like I was gonna like oh, well I'll eventually come back to this and I'll I'll, uh, I'll address this in the future but I never did. It works it's great, like, very iconic. You know if you see teal dice, you know it's from the old camera. Yeah, it's true. Teal dice with film symbols. Yeah, probably the only game with teal dice and film symbols. I, <laughs> I imagine so. Yes. This was the version I. This is the final one that I prototyped that I made. Let me. Here. Uh, this is super close to the final version. Yeah, it is. Here you can see the scene card. I've got the arrows here. I mean, even the sketches. This is the sketch that I ended up using for the final artwork. And I actually really liked it in this sketch form. I thought it was pretty cool. But um, what's different from this one than the current version? Well, I inked over this. Mm -hmm. and then this is just like the rough drawing version. Right? But see, I don't know. There's something about the like the pencil drawing look that's kind of cool. I really liked it. But it had to go. And then, of course, during the campaign, it went from a white background. People, people really, really pushed me on like it should be a colorful board. And so I bent the will of the people. And I think actually it's better. It's the great thing about Kickstarter is that you can. Put in something that's like 90% done, and uh, and then you can get feedback, and you can get ideas, and you can help with stuff. And I really, I just, it's because I'm doing everything myself, and I don't, there's not a big office, there's not a big like team of people in an office in a studio somewhere. It's literally just me, and sometimes Eric helps me. <laughs> um, that can get really, you can get inside your own head a lot. It's really, it's really hard to like get feedback and ideas, and so that's why I love going to Kickstarter and just involving people in those decisions, going like, what do you think? What if I did this? What if I did that? Um, and usually they're pretty honest because they put their money up. <laughs> so they want it to be right. Yeah, and there's also always ideas that you didn't think about that you know, hundreds of people have thought them through. Or because there's, there's 2,000 people, 2,500 people yeah. watching it, that like one of them is going to have an idea you didn't think of. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Movie The Man says, you use it the right way in your communication. Not everybody does. I think it's a great tool to, to really directly communicate with with the, your audience before the, it's actually complete. It, but you're right, um, movie demand that it has to be done it has to be done right because there are other creators that think they have to do that, and so they use that as like a crutch or. Or they put in, you know, they let the people make decisions that are actually inconsequential or, or vote on things that are already decided. Um, and I think it's, and 
I, I think it's important that you, that, you know, the, I, I mean, I guess it's, it doesn't matter whether it's important or not, but to me it's way more useful to actually have actionable feedback that, on something that you're actually stuck with. The, the other flip side to that is that you can get people thinking that your game is not done or it's not going to be done. I, I'm seeing this right now with the ARCS Kickstarter that's, that's on that, you know, Leader Games is, um, their whole thing is that they put out a game much earlier in development than other publishers do. And the number of comments of people going like, this game is not done. Why does the graphic design look bad? Why does the artwork not done? And it's like, well, you know, we're working on, we, like, look at the other previous campaigns. We like to do this earlier than usual, but they're spending so much time fielding these questions. And I think that that's because there are, you know, there are, unfortunately, campaigns that go out on Kickstarter that are not finished and that the developers are not complete. I mean, this happens in video games all the time. Eric is a video game publisher and designer and in video game Kickstarters. Yeah. I mean, how many of them actually deliver in the end? Yeah, it's pretty rare. So you need to walk this really fine line. I appreciate you saying that because you need, do need to watch, walk this fine line of like a, a game that is incomplete enough to have people be involved in its completion, but not so incomplete that it doesn't seem like a product that's actually going to yeah. cross the finish line and actually going to be in your hands so that your money's in a good place. Yeah, totally. So I want to show you um, two design deviations or kind of like branches that I explored and, and that were dead ends because I think that's always interesting with um, with design. The first is um, this, remember I mentioned this already, so the film school. So I, I wanted there to be a version of the game which you could learn very, uh, very easily with a younger group because I felt like with this artwork and with the theme it might appeal to a younger crowd than might be willing to digest the amount of rules. One of the problems with the roll camera, uh, its design, is that you kind of need to know all the rules before you start your first turn. You can kind there is a way you can kind of walk through it a little bit, but in order for you to assign those dice properly, like in that very first turn, you need to know what um, what the consequences are going to be. Um, I mean, luckily there's a bit of padding in that you kind of you know you go over things. Like I like we said before, like it's that tension curve where you spend a lot of money up front and then, um, uh, and then later maybe spend maybe realize you have you should have done things differently. People almost always lose their first game, which I think is a good thing. But I still wanted there to be a bit of more of an onboarding version, and so I created this um, this here <laughs> film school, which is like I stripped down the game as far as it possibly could go where there were no set pieces, it was just this light grid, there were only two scenes you could choose from, and the quality track was only one up. And three total to shoot to win? Just needed three, it was like a short film was the idea. And it was, the idea was to introduce you to the basic mechanics. Again, the audience being like your grandma, or like you know your seven-year-old cousin, or someone that you wanted to kind of play the basics of the game with. And the problem was I couldn't get it to work. I, like without, like here I had schedule, that was the only thing, there was no budget. And it just, it just didn't work. It was, it just didn't work. You needed all the pieces to get the machine to operate. Yeah, the game was only fun when all of its pieces were together and, uh, yeah, exactly, and like talking to each other. I guess it'd just be more of a puzzle game, wouldn't it? This version. Roll camera junior, yeah. <laughs> I'd still, I mean, maybe there's still a world in which I could create like a, like a standalone variant uh, or like a standalone version of Roll Camera that was, that was called Film School, Roll Camera Film School. Mm -hmm. It could be kind of fun. If it was like a travel version, maybe, it could be kind of cool. Um, it would have to be single player. Uh, yeah, I guess it could be. Why? I don't know. Could have different roles. I could, you could make some more film school jokes and stuff. Yeah, I think you could do it, but it would be... I, I couldn't make it work for this version anyway. Um, the second one I want to show you was... This was intended to be part of the, the shipped version. In fact, it was, I was ready to put this on the Kickstarter page um, because I wanted something to do on the... Um, I wanted something on the reverse side of the board. And I thought, like, oh, well, maybe I could get a competitive version in here if right. it was team based and so I <laughs> this was the only time I put this out I don't think I even I think I played maybe a little bit of it before I realized like look at what a mess this is so what you're looking at is the game the entire game 
squeezed into half and then another half. The idea being that two teams of people, two people here and two people here, could sit and make competing films mm -hmm. using the same storyboard scenes, oh no, sorry, different storyboard scenes, the same set area. Mm -hmm. The idea was like you could, like you were shooting a film in the same location at the same time, two different films, and whoever made the best, the film with the best quality at the end would win the game. It was just a mess. Yeah. <laughs> it's an absolute mess. <laughs> I can imagine. But it was a cool uh, graphic design experiment to kind of see like, could I get this to work? I mean, I feel like the well, the pro everyone had their own problems, but the scene deck was the same. No, we had separate scene decks. I feel like if you shared the scene deck, shared the set pieces, shared the set, it might actually work. Well, I I tried a bunch of different versions. I couldn't I couldn't get it to work satisfactorily, and I decided at the end it was better to just focus on one thing. You know. Mm -hmm focus on doing one thing right instead of trying to squeeze too much into the game. But I actually did stick to this um, this idea of doing like a, a cooperative or competitive or semi-competitive or semi-cooperative variant. Um, and again, this is another version that I like was very close to being done. Oh, I don't have it. Oh, here it is. Uh, being in the final version before the Kickstarter, and a friend of mine said, "No, just don't force it," you know. Um, and that was this. That was the competitive, uh, uh, the, the semi-competitive version. So, when it came time to make the expansion, I put this mod together and I, I built it back up again. But it was initially going to be part of it. And the idea was here that you would, so you would, you had these take credit cards, and there was this credit tracker. So this would be me, and this would be you. And we're both playing regular roll camera, all the rules are the same, except every time uh, different things happen, you would gain credit on this track. So here, these were secret. So I'd have this in my hand, and it would be like, oh, I get three credit if the quality tracker goes back into, it's like in the, in the green and it goes back to the red. Right. So then I would get three if I managed to make that happen. Um, and you would get it if, um, you would get, uh, if, if you know you shot a blue scene while you hold this card you would get two credit you right know? so we're so like then, secretly competing for these to gain credit on, for the movie yeah what was cool about it is then you'd be like the idea was you'd be like oh let's shoot that blue scene we're like why it's not we don't need that for the movie right. like yeah but i mean it's cheap it's the cheapest one right like we should probably shoot that blue scene um and that was what i was hoping is that it would create this sense of like these like negotiations like secret like oh, is he doing that because he wants to like we gotta win and then the idea was at the end of the game, uh, if you won under all the other conditions, so like the um, the budget, you're under budget, you're on schedule, and like this is outside the red zone, then whoever had the most credit in the end, you could basically take credit for the film doing well. Right. Uh, and if you're in last <coughs> last place, double credit. That doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> Oh yeah, that was that was my catch-up mechanism. So like, if you if, let's say it's three-player, and we got one person here in, in like way behind, this would count double if they if you're in last place. So like, oh I see. So like here, uh, let's say this one, if a blue scene is shot, you get two credit. Well, actually, you'd get four. So actually, it was a good way to like prevent a runaway leader. But um, and then at the end of the the game, whoever had the uh, the most would win, unless you lost. So if at the end of the game you were out of budget or this you know the quality was here in the middle or the uh the schedule ran out then whoever had the least credit would win the game because thematically you could be like wasn't it wasn't me like this film crashed and burned but like i can still get another job in the industry because like i was the least involved with that it. just got people to sabotage the movies yeah all the games ended in failure yeah. um, and also it was just really uninteresting to have you know, if you the problem is these dice that you pass these dice to each player when it's their turn, and that sometimes you know how you can you can like set a couple dice in and pass the dice on to the next player, mm -hmm. that relies on you working together, working together and being like mutually incentivized to do to work towards the same goal. Whereas if you, um, yeah, if you don't, then this just completely falls apart. And so we couldn't make it work, even though I really liked I liked it on paper. Mm -hmm. Um, and the genre cards, actually, I want to show you something. So these, this was way early on in the 
in the development. So here you can actually still see, um, here at the bottom of this scene card is this real icon, which was back when the, the quality tracker was like Blockbuster or um, uh, once I was Blockbuster, once I was Awards. And this was the symbol for like what that was, the little film reel. Um, and I created these genre scenes. So this is actually a scene in the B-movie expansion. I was looking at the wanted poster. This as well, the zombie coming out of the ground, that's in the B-movie expansion. And even though these are, I'm just realizing these looking back to it, like these are a lot of these, this one's not. <laughs> um, these are scenes, so I had this idea for to make these genre scenes, and the idea was that the genre scenes would, would have, uh, you'd have a different requirement. So here there's like a little cowboy boot, and like maybe there would be certain scripts that needed like a genre, specific genres, a little ghost for the horror. Um, and they didn't end up working out, so I scrapped them pretty early on. But then when it came time to do an expansion, I thought, well, I've always wanted to do these, bring these genre, these genre scenes back in. Um, and so I... I mean, that's pretty much what it became, right? Not that different from, uh, from in the end, what it was. Uh, if I go back to this... So here, these are the these. Is, I was just playing around with these um, scene cards when we when I started development on the uh, the initial design steps on the expansion. I uh, had these scene cards, and the idea was kind of cool. So the idea here was uh, they'd introduce a new mechanic that make the game slightly more difficult. Which here was the the little dotted line scenes or sorry dice placements were like optional. So you didn't have to have them filled to shoot the scene, but if you did, for each one that you did, you would get that bonus. Right. Like here you would gain a dollar. Um, there were ones where you would gain two quality or like get to move dice or move set pieces or like there was one where you can even resolve problems, I think, or gain an idea card. Yeah. So this was a cool... I thought this was kind of clever because it gave you... It interacted with a bunch of the different systems, added a new layer of challenge mm -hmm. because otherwise if you don't do either of those, then you don't get the bonus at all. Right. Um, which is obviously worse. Um, the problem with this was that it it's just too much to parse. It's like visually, it's kind of messy. Um, it's just and it's not as fun as it sounds, actually. Um, so when I brought this on over to the developer um, to develop the B movie expansion, they they brought in uh, you know much more of the the other ideas that came in um, with these tokens uh, that you could move. You know, as as in the actual expansion, um, that were much more suited to gameplay. Added a new mechanic, a new layer that um, that worked a lot better. Right. And the script, the third segment of the script that involved the scenes, or the the genres themselves. Right. Um, that was something that we worked on a little bit. We tried to figure out uh, how we were going to integrate the the genre part of the of the expansion into it and. Eventually, we settled on this idea that, like, oh, you could just have another script half, a third script half. Right. All right. Well, that is the design journey of Roll Camera, and now you know. Now you can you can play the uh, the final version here up on Tabletop Simulator, and uh, I've added the expansion now, so you can. Um, it has all the expansion content, it has all the revised second printing base game content. Um, it's got all the new production company cards and a lot of great scripting that helps. Um... Oh yeah, because I'm not a color. But anyway, it's got everything uh, set up and that's the final, final version of Bill Camera as it exists. So thank you, Eric. Yeah, thanks for having me on this journey. <laughs> well, thanks for helping. No, I, and I, I mean this. Thanks for helping me develop this game because um, you've played dozens, hundreds of iterations and versions and games giving feedback, and it's not easy because most of those are bad. And now, you know, it's funny now. Eric, you know, as we say, oh, let's play, let's play some roll camera. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, I don't know how you still can play it. <laughs> Once you work so much on something, then you get tired of seeing it. <laughs> But, but now, I, I do think that the result is actually really good. It's well, really it, like hit the nail on the head on what it's trying to be. I think it succeeded. Well, I couldn't have done it without you. Well, thank you. Um, and I couldn't have done it without you, watcher, backer. Uh, I really appreciate 
you helping make this game into a reality. Now it can be on our shelves, and I'm excited for the B-Movie expansion so I can actually get back. Now I'm excited to get back into some real camera, actually. Um, all right, well, thanks very much. Is there any other questions? Uh, Movie Demand says, thanks for sharing this journey. Looking forward to the expansion. Right on. They can play the expansion on Tabletop Simulator now. Yeah, so as I said on, on TTS, it's already, uh, you can get all the expansion content up there. All the artwork is done. Took me a while. Um, cool. All right. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. See ya later. Bye.